Um, so the reason I'm talking to you about Treasure fundamentally is because um, I am a member of the Treasure Valuation Committee, so I have a, a vested interest in getting people to understand what the process is, um, but also, just alluding to what um, Kat said this morning, I just worked out in my head that I've actually been paid to work on archaeological collections now for 35 years, but I've been in museums for 39 years, which is really seriously means I probably am a piece of treasure, because <laughs> um, obviously I'm a, a treasure. Um, so the purpose of this bit of the workshop is just to introduce the kind of like legal framework that relates to treasure, uh, to enable an, an understanding of the definitions, to uh, explain to you uh, what I think is the museum role in that process and where some of the, um, possibly the lack of confidence that lots of people have got in terms of working with treasure, and also to explain the work of the Treasure Valuation Committee so that you understand how they come to their um, decision-making process um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Treasure Trove to start off with because that is still relevant even though we now all operate under the terms of the Treasure Act. Um, there is still an element of the Treasure Act which incorporates um, Treasure Trove. I'm going to take you through what is treasure, what is not treasure, some of the ethical considerations and some of the ways that you might be able to engage more with the process. So, in the beginning, there was Treasure Trove, and yes, I predate the 1996 Treasure Act, so I did have to deal with items which were Treasure Trove. And the reason that the Sutton Who mask, just there, has got a great big red cross through it, is although all of that Sutton Who is gold, is treasure, looks like treasure, it's got garnets, it looks fantastic, actually, under the common law of Treasure Trove, it was not treasure. And that is for one very simple reason, it was because it came from a burial site. So if you look at what the common law said in a nutshell, items made of gold or silver, so it only covered things which were made out of those two precious metals, that had been hidden and rediscovered for which ownership could not be proven, with no known heir, and that line at the bottom, buried with the intent to recover. So if something had been buried with a burial, the assumption was that they were buried for eternity and not therefore buried with the intent to recover, which is why the Sutton Hoo treasure, when it was found, uh, was not deemed to be treasure trove. And the reason that it's in the British Museum is because the landowner decided to gift it to the nation. So it would not have been covered by treasure trove. So in terms of that, that makes it really difficult because obviously it only covers two places two particular kinds of materials. It's not covering any of the other things that are found with it. There are lots of some unknowns, so you had to have hidden it and then somebody rediscovered it. Um, the ownership is unknown. That's, that's similar to the, what we've got with Treasure today. No known heir. And also, um, there are similarities between Treasure Trove and the current situation in that there was still a duty to report. Now, there's a lot of things that fall into those categories of gold or silver. Um, there's no percentage um, that's involved. It had to be gold or silver. Um, and it also included things like individual coins. So that meant, as with today's process, those coins which were found could have been hidden and rediscovered. Nobody knew who they were. Um, they weren't buried with the intent to recover necessarily. There were losses. We ended up with lots of single gold, single gold or silver coin finds, which would still have to go through a coroner's inquest to determine whether they were treasure or not. So you can imagine the amount of bureaucracy and then lots of arguing about whether it did actually fall into this definition or not. Um, the other thing to realise, and this is from a Bristol Museum perspective, which is where I'm from, um, there are four places um, which had a franchise potentially to collect treasure over and above the crown. Because what Treasure Trove said was everything belonged to the crown. Um, and that's similar to today as well. But there had been incidences in the past. So the Duchies of Lancaster and Cornwall, the Corporations of London and Bristol Corporation were gifted the right to collect treasure, in our case, by um, uh, about 500 years ago by the king. Um, and that franchise potentially still exists, and that has been rewritten into the current legislation and has not been tested, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So we've got to compare that with um, what is treasure. So this is um, the Mildenhall treasure. You might be familiar with it. It's on display at the British Museum. It was a find which was reported to the authorities after the Second World War. Essentially, a farmer had found it, um, an antiquarian collector called Dr. Fawcett, who I've got his collection in Bristol Museum, it's got nothing to do with Bristol, 
Um, he used to frequent lots of farmers. He would speak to them. He would ask them what they'd found on the fields and then acquire it for his collection. And one day he went to visit this particular farmer and saw two silver spoons sitting on the mantelpiece and said, where did you get them and have you got anything else? And that's when the farmer undid the cabinet and said, this is what I've got and I've been using it to put my fruit on at Christmas. Um, and at that point in time, Dr. Fawcett realised that this was treasure. This had been hidden away. Um, there are lots of questions about how it got into the ground, um, but essentially he reported to the farmer, to the land, to the authorities. And the point of this is not only is this is treasure, it was buried with intent to recover, it's made out of silver, there was a duty to report, and it was reported, except not by the finder. So he'd actually concealed the find for a while. And that meant that he couldn't be rewarded with the full market value, which was actually prevalent at that time. Um, and that, that amount was abated. So there are words that get used through this process. So the abatement of a, a reward means a reduction because you haven't reported in good faith. Um, and so their reward, he didn't get the full um, reward for it. Shooting further forward, um, as Ben has already explained, there were problems in terms of what could or couldn't be treasure. Um, so there was new legislation, and you'll see it's called the Treasure Act 1996, but actually it only covers fines found after the 24th of September 1997. Um, and the reason I've put that in there more than anything else is because there are some things that still get brought into museums and fines liaison officers which would constitute treasure but were found before 1997. So I've had several uh, instances where people have bought things to the museum and told me they've been sitting on their mantelpiece or in their cupboard for many, many years, and they didn't realise that it might be treasure until they saw something similar uh, on television or in a museum display. Um, we had some lovely Celtic gold coins that were bought in that way. People thought they were just buttons, literally, because they had no notion that this might have been any form of treasure, and they were discovered before this date. So they are dealt with by the previous legislation. Um, so there have been some changes to the Act. Uh, it's supplemented by the treasure, de treasure Designation Order, so that covers some different categories that were added, and I will explain what the categories were. And so they are for fines made after January the 1st, 2003. Um, and more importantly, it's accompanied by a code of practice. So you get the Act and some orders which add bits of information to it, and a code of practice which explains how it should be um, meted out. Um, so I'll talk about that now. So the definition. This is the definition, and it was a significant move forward from what was treasure trove. So metal objects other than coins, first one. Anything which is not coin, which is 10% by weight, gold or silver, and at least 300 years old. Now, the difficulty here is that that's a, three, a roll in 300 years. So it's 300 years from today. And next year, it'll be 300 years from next year and 300 years from the next year. So there's some question about whether that needs to be changed. Also, the treasure, the treasure designation ordered added new categories of treasure. If it was prehistoric metal object with any amount of gold or silver on it, so it didn't have to meet that 10% by weight, it could be gold plating that was on the surface of something, um, which was prehistoric, of any kind of metal, that can be treasure. Groups of two or more metal objects of prehistoric date from the same find. So it might be two axes that were buried together, two pole staves that were buried together. Doesn't matter what kind of metal they are made out of. And that was added significantly because they are so rare in comparison to everything else. Two or more coins uh, of the, from the same find, so considered to be a hoard, found in the same place together of similar dates, at least 300 years old when found, that contain 10% gold or silver. But if there's less than 10%, there must be more than 10. So that means now that all coin hoards, which are more than 300 years old, that have two or more coins in, so in other words, all the bronze or copper alloy coin hoards that might be Roman, are treasure. Um, and they were never covered. And then anything, pretty much, that was found together with it. So the box, the bag, the jewels, any other items made out of bone, stone, etc., etc., that might have been part of a hoard, they are also part of the object, the treasure grouping. And then that catch-all at the bottom. Any object that would have been previously treasure trove but does not fall into the categories above. And you might be a bit confused now as to what could possibly fall into the categories above. 
Remember, the 300 years old. So any item which was buried with the intent to recover made out of gold or silver, which is less than 300 years old, with no known heir, could be considered treasure because it would fall into that previous category of treasure trove, which is why it's important to understand what the treasure trove uh, definition was. Um, and it did come up relatively recently where somebody found a big bag of uh, gold sovereigns, I think it was, that had been hidden down the back of the piano, which were obviously a group that had been hidden there with intent to recover no known heir, and they were trying to trace those people, but they were less than 300 years old, so they were covered under the treasure trove um, legislation. Duty to report. This is something that's happened relatively recently. Uh, the last time I gave this talk uh, was in uh, Exeter in December, and this was what was just happening. So two metal detectorists were accused of stealing a three million pound haul of Anglo-Saxon gold coins and jewellery after finding it in the field. And essentially they concealed the find of treasure and they'd started to sell it off. Um, it was um, a big detective job on, part, on the part of Fines Liaison Officers, the police, um, Portable Antiquity Scheme involvement in all of this. Um, they were taken to court and the upshot is, and the, the thing I should have added on here is that one was sent to prison for eight and a half years and the other one was sent to prison for ten. So actually within the Act, there is, um, it's a criminal offence to actually not report treasure, to conceal it, to try and sell it on. So, so they... There's a, uh, an unlimited fine and a prison sentence that can be attached to it, but the, there were cumulative offences. So there was a trying to sell on stolen goods, for example. Um, and interestingly, with this case, they are going to now try and go for the proceeds of crime uh, through this. So they're going to now try and recover things, the money, essentially, that went to these people because they still don't know where the rest of this hoard went to. So you can just... You can Google that, you'll find it. Um, there was a lot of interest, obviously, from Fines Liaison Officers and museums because this is the biggest. In fact, before this, it was really difficult to find any example whatsoever where somebody who had done something against the Act had been prosecuted successfully. This was all over the press. Um, so this will be a big wake-up call for people who try to do it. In terms of what happens when you report, um, the Code of Practice and the Act allows for rewards to be paid, and those rewards um, are, can go to uh, the finder, the landowner, or a tenant of that land. So the law basically says, apart from treasure, anything that comes out of the ground belongs to the landowner. And the reason it could be any one of these is because there can be an agreement between the landowner and the tenant. So there is a code of good practice for metal detectors. You can find a copy of it on the fines.org website. Um, there's a code of practice just there. And that says, you know, there should be an agreement between landowners and people who are searching on their land. And don't forget, it's not just people with metal detectors that find objects. And there can be a written agreement which apportions rewards. And that reward is the market value of the find should a museum want to acquire it. And that's the really important thing because not all museums want to acquire treasure. And I put that little picture up just there because uh, my first slide showed you a lot of coins. That was the, um, the Thornby coin hoard, which consisted of um, many, many, many coins um, and something like 11,500. And the Evening Post in Bristol very carefully went to eBay and worked out what the average cost of one of these coins would be on eBay and then extrapolated from that and said it was worth £120,000. But they forgot actually that um, there weren't as many coins as they thought and they were all wet and they were dirty and you don't get prices from eBay. Um, so they anticipated it would be about £120,000. If it had been, and we wanted to acquire it because we did, it was from our collecting area, it met all our collecting policy, we have to find that valuation, but that valuation comes from the Treasure Valuation Committee in order to acquire it. So that's some of the things that you have to navigate. So, the other thing I'm going to say about rewards here is that if you're a professional archaeologist or anybody who is engaged on an archaeological excavation or investigation, and that includes volunteers, you cannot claim a reward for finding treasure if a museum mm -hmm. wants to acquire it. And there are difficulties with this. And that definition just there, there of what is an archaeologist formed the basis of one of the questions uh, when we've just been consulted about possible changes to the code of practice. So the code of practice should be reviewed about every five years. 
but actually we haven't had a new one for about 10 or 11 years now. So DCMS, who were charged with dealing with this, um, sent out a consultation, um, and, and the questions were to do with what was a better definition for archaeologists, um, all kinds of things about whether we should shift the change, the dates, whether it should be everything which is 300 years old, or whether it should be everything after a certain date or before a certain date, um, and what an archaeologist actually meant within the, def within the code of practice. Um, and the reason I put this little picture here is because that's an object that we acquired through the treasure process, which actually came from a piece of Bristol City Council land that was recovered by a professional unit. So professional units need to understand what the treasure system is as much as uh, museums do, um, because this was actually um, given straight over to the museum because the landowner was Bristol City Council. They didn't want any of the reward money because it was Bristol City Council and we were funded by them. The archaeologists couldn't claim a reward, therefore there was no, it didn't go through the process and it came directly to us. Um, so there are instances recently that I've experienced where I do know that um, there are commercial units who do not understand the treasure process. So that's maybe one of the conversations you want to have with them about what the process actually looks like for them. Um, and equally, um, developers and their contractors do not understand the treasure process necessarily. Um, and I had to go chasing around the houses for about a week trying to find out where several hundred Roman coins had disappeared to after diggers had put them in their pockets thinking they could do that on a site. Um, we got about 200 back, but we were told that there was at least 1,000. There are also some difficulties with what the Act says uh, in terms of the definitions, because it doesn't cover some of the most spectacular finds that come out of the ground. So if it doesn't fall into any of those definitions, which are a treasure trove, or any of the 10% by gold or weight, et cetera, et cetera, um, then it can go back to the finder and or the landowner. It's not considered to be treasure, and they can do with it as they like. Um, and so there is a desire to review the definition of treasure uh, to try and incorporate some of these extraordinary finds. So the one which really prompts a lot of the conversations, and I've had other ones recently in my own area, is the Crosby Garrett helmet, which you might be aware of. It was on display at the Tully House Museum a couple of times in Carlisle. It came out of the ground in pieces. And that's something you should also remember, is when treasure is valued, it's valued as it is found not as it is conserved, put back together, or cleaned. It should be as it comes out of the ground. Well, this wasn't treasure. It's bronze. Um, it's, not, it's more than 300 years old. It's got no element of gold or silver to it. Um, but it, uh, it didn't fall under any of that. It was conserved. Uh, whether you agree with how it was put back together again or not is a moot point. Uh, Tully House tried to fundraise to go to auction. It was taken to auction. They managed to sort out enough money to pay the estimate, um, but in fact it sold for 2.330 pounds. So that's it, something like 2 million, 330,000 pounds and the rest. And it's in a private collection. And nobody knows who the owner is, which means that it's not available for anybody to study at will. Um, the agents deal for, on, on behalf of the owner, but nobody knows who the owner is. And then the other thing that we've got are single finds of gold coins. Now, single gold coins of particular types, particularly during the Roman period, are very rare. Um, but if you changed the, the, the definition to say, well, single finds of gold coins pre, so pre-Roman and also all the prehistoric, you'd also bring in to play all the Celtic coins that were coming out of the ground. And some of those you will find in some areas of the country, and this is, comes back to some of the kinds of things that, that Ben was saying, in some areas of the country, a museum might not want to acquire that Celtic gold coin because they are, without trying to be too punny, ten a penny in those areas, as opposed to when you find one in my area, they're really rare and I would really like one of those. So it's quite difficult to find that definition and there is some talk, and there was some talk through the consultation, that we might have to have some kind of process like you have for uh, the export of items going out of the country. So it's how you work out what those significant items would be and who would make those decisions. So there are some difficulties with the definition. I want to flag this up because this is something that you can go away and look at for yourself. So Portable Antiquity Scheme has a conference every year 
and we had a panel session about treasure and this was um, a Twitter um, moment that was put together by Andrew Woods, who is the keeper at Yorkshire Museum. Um, and he did this little case study about what the positive and negatives for museums were in terms of acquiring treasure. Um, and you can go, if you choose that URL, you can go through and you can see how he has actually categorised what the positives and negatives are in terms of being able to engage with the public. So, you know, for example, increasing the number of objects that are collected, uh, how some items had raised the ambition of the museum in terms of the way that um, they connected with the public, because treasure has got that, it's, it's an odd word, it spikes people's interest. As soon as you use it, it goes with skeletons and dinosaurs and Egyptians generally. Um, so some of the key words that you know that people will react to, treasure is one of them. Uh, lots of archaeologists, field archaeologists in particular in my experience, hate the word treasure and, uh, because obviously all archaeological material is of interest and not some specific de designation and it is bandied around. Um, so they, you know, he says that they acquired approximately 10% of what came through. And that's the other thing to realise is when we go through this process, um, a museum can disclaim, and I'll explain what disclaim means as well as abate. So, to collect or not to collect, that is the question. On the left-hand side, I've already introduced you to the Thornbury Hoard. It's a hoard of 4th century Roman coins. There are quite a lot of uh, hoards of 4th century Roman coins, Constantinian coins, in the country. We didn't have one. Uh, it was the largest one that had come out of the ground in our collecting area. Uh, it was an opportunity for us to keep it together as a single, fight, a single uh, group. Lots of the large hoards that had been found in the Victorian period and earlier had been dispersed, which means that if we retained it as a whole, it retained its full research value. Uh, we went through the whole process. We expressed an interest to acquire. It went through the valuation process. That process can be a little bit combative with the finder. Usually you find that the finder has a really good relationship potentially with the finds liaison officer and the museum until the point that evaluation comes in and lands in your email tray because clearly the finder would like to have more money than is being offered generally, not all of them, um, and the museum wants to acquire it for the best possible amount that it possibly can because it has to fundraise generally. We don't have a purchase fund, we have no acquisition fund. In order to be able to acquire this, we had to go through the process of fundraising through several different organisations and eventually went to HLF. HLF do not fund acquisitions of objects, but they will fund um, interpretation, engagement. They, so that meant that in order to acquire the treasure, I had to uh, get them to pay for a case, get them to pay for the school's programme, and then do all the evaluation that was associated with it. So essentially, sell your life for about another 18 months on top of. <sighs> That's really what happens. So why would you collect? Kat's already mentioned your collecting policy. Everything reverts back to your collecting policy. You must write something in there about treasure. And what I'll tell you now is it should never never say that you will collect all items of treasure found in your collecting area. You might think that is funny, but there is at least one museum that I can think of that used to have that in their collecting policy. And not every item of treasure is, has any archaeological significance, because clearly there are bits of things that come out of the ground which are more than 10% gold or silver, more than 300 years old, that do not advance the archaeological record one jot. And so you need to think about what is the archaeological significance. And that's not just generally to the world or to Britain or to your area. It could be to your collection and it could be to your stakeholders because archaeological significance varies between people. So archaeologists have a view of what significance means, but community groups will have a completely different view. And I usually use the example of one Roman brooch added to my collection is not really of much archaeological significance. But actually, to the community where it's found, it was the only Roman brooch that came out of the ground. And that is their connection with that period. And therefore, it's highly significant. So you need to think about that. Collection value add. So what does it add to your collection? We get things through the Treasure Valuation Committee where people who are not museum curators will say, it's not very pretty, or it's, why would you want to collect that? And the answer is, because I might not have one. It's, it's got archaeological significance. It's really rare in my area. You know, any item of bronze, bronze Age gold that comes out of the ground for me would add to the three bits that I've got. 
And, but it might only be a little scrappy bit, but it's really, really important as far as our collection is concerned. I am not interested in collecting any more filigree Tudor um, silver-headed pins, spherical-headed pins, because I've already got enough of them. So it would have to be really spectacular, because they are quite common. And I am not the pin-collecting capital of the world. So you've got to think about what are your priorities in terms of your collection? What will it add? I might want to collect dress fasteners. There are lots of dress fasteners that come out of the ground. They're not always really particularly interesting. But actually, in terms of what you're going to do with display, for example, one dress fastener on its own is not really that engaging for members of the public. But when you show them an array of different types of silver dress fastener, they get more of a sense of what the variety might be and how they're fixed or anything like that. So, you know, you can't have a one-size-fits-all kind of like rule. What will you do with community engagement? I talked about the Roman brooch that came out from somewhere. They want to know about that Roman brooch more than anything else in the world because it's probably the, the, the most ancient thing they've ever seen. Um, and then what about teaching? So there are things that come out of the ground. And again, you can do this with the fines liaison officer. There are things that come out of the ground um, that might, you might want to engage with with um, schools, colleges, or anywhere else. There's all reasons why you might want to collect, but it always comes down to your collecting policy. Can I just add as well that, um, you know, I was talking earlier about how collections overlap. I found at least one case where I would have turned a piece of treasure down, but my colleague, social history curator, said actually that would fit perfectly into the social history collection and another strand that we're looking at. So even if something doesn't have archaeological significance, they still become part of the museum collection in a different way, so there's different ways to look at treasure 17th century spoons. <laughs> we have the same thing. Yeah. So apostle spoons might fit into the applied art collection, yes. and they're looking for particular makers, but it's not really anything archaeological. So yes, there are overlaps across, across all of them. Some problems that we have in terms of identification, uh, it's not always easy to identify what things are. Um, and... Um, coins, single coin finds, as I've said before, are not treasure. If they've been modified, they're an object. So you can have a single coin find, which is gold or silver, uh, which has been modified by somebody putting a hole through it, through them bending it, cutting pieces off of it and turning it into something else, which actually fundamentally is a coin that's been turned into an object. And that's why it would go through the treasure valuation process. These are actually coin clippings. They're sometimes called toenail clippings. Um, we've had a couple of cases like that. So there are issues in terms of identification. And if you get things brought into the museum and you don't know what they are, and, and I'm fortunate, you know, the Fines Liaison Officer has worked in my office for the last 16 years. I see all the treasure that comes out of the whole of Avon and Gloucestershire, irrespective of whether it's from my collecting area. We can have a conversation about that. But if you don't have a flow that's based in your museum, contact your flow. Contact your flow because they will able, be able to help you. And then also there are issues in terms of your capacity to collect and the finance. I've already talked about the fact that there was no acquisition budget for us to acquire and you've got to fundraise. You have to be really honest with yourself about your capacity to do this. Um, and also your capacity to do all of those things which are required for accreditation in terms of can I look after it, can I curate it, is it going to be on display, um, can we resource this? Um, and this is a case which came up in Gloucestershire. It's a set of child-sized Bronze Age bangles, which were all buried, uh, so they nestled inside each other. And the local museum um, decided that it didn't have the security, it didn't have the expertise, it didn't have the capacity as volunteers to put together the fundraising bid. Now, fortunately, these were of national and international significance. There's nothing else like it in the archaeological record. And so the British Museum decided to acquire them for the national collection, but they still had to pay the reward. The British Museum cannot always be the backstop. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about, I, I chair a group for Portable Antiquity Scheme, which is the museum's um, sort of working group. Um, and I also sit on the Portable Antiquities Advisory Group. And one of the things we're talking about is maybe working regionally so that you, know, you can talk to each other don't, you've got a collecting area. We have in our collecting policy something which says we will collect from this geographic area and specify what it is. We will only collect outside of that area under extraordinary circumstances. And it could be possible that there is an extraordinary circumstance where your museum has capacity to collect something for your region that the museum next door does not. 
And that means you must talk to other people that live across those boundaries and try and act together. Um, because the, what I'd really love to have had this in Bristol Museum so that people could see it in the local region, apart from the fact that I really love Bronze Age gold anyway, um, but I would really have loved to have had that there to give people the opportunity to see it where it was found, but it, it defaulted to the British Museum on that occasion. And I've just said, the, the expressing interest. So uh, if a find of treasure comes out of the ground, the process should be that the local collecting museum uh, is given the opportunity to say whether it wants to express an interest in acquiring that object. Um, and what I would say is to take that matter very carefully and consider from your collecting policy. It is not, in my opinion, ethical to express an interest in an object that you then choose not to acquire because you don't like the valuation. That's, you know, this goes through a process. If you express an interest, it goes through the valuation process. It goes through a coroner's inquest. If it's disclaimed, then it goes back to the finder. So that means that there is a bit of onus on museum curators to understand what the potential values of these objects are. Now, I understand that there are difficulties. I'm a curator. There are difficulties in working out what the valuations of objects are. And we all know that we are bound by the Museums Association Code of Ethics, which says we do not do valuations on items that come from members of the public. So that makes us a bit reticent to engage with any of this process. But actually, ethically, you should be thinking about what does this, this is a little dress hook, so we're not talking about millions of pounds or something like this. You can find out what things have been valued at by looking at treasure annual reports, for instance, so things that are in the public domain. It is much harder now to find out what things have gone for at auction because they're behind a paywall generally. Um, but you can find out through treasure annual reports, and it is a bit of a trawl, and one of the, um, the upgrades to the, the Portal Antiquity Scheme database is potentially to load information in about previous valuations. Um, just that. I think some of the TVC minutes are on the website now. Yes, they are. So the latest ones have gone up. So you can, you can go through, and, and actually it's the minutes are much more easy because you can do a control F search across. Exactly. And I do exactly the same thing because part of my role is, uh, of that is not to actually come up with the valuation. It's to comment on the valuations that independent valuers have provided the committee. Um, so there is a little bit of onus. And, and this is another occasion where you can speak to your colleagues about things. And fundamentally, if you've got any doubts about what things might be worth, go to the treasure registrars. The treasure registrars have all of the data and the experience. And they won't do a valuation for you, but they will be able to say, in general, this common type of object would really usually really be, be worth in this kind of region. So that's what you might expect. So do that bit of work for it first even if it's just kind of like half a day before you express an interest and then withdraw. Because if you withdraw, all of that process then becomes redundant and imagine the cost of that and the time. And that also adds to the, the waiting time for people to go through the process. And I know because I've spoken to Ian, uh, Treasure Registrar, and I know that they've done some figures, the average cost of evaluation from an independent valuer um, is about £150. That's for one object. Um, so, average costs don't actually express what 5,000 gold coins might actually cost to, to value. So, there is, there is a cost to the public purse in this. Um, and what, what I'm saying is that it's ethically unsound. If you have made a decision based on your collecting policy that it should be in your collection, you should follow it through. Okay? So, you should follow it through. That's us. Oh, sorry, that's not us. Um, for, so museums engaging with evaluation just there. Um, so museums engaging with that valuation, you get an option to say, do you want to collect it in the first place? Then you, are get, you get sent a provisional valuation. So valuations are commissioned from independent valuers. You, if you want to find out what the process is, what I've done in my presentation at the bottom is provide you with all the URLs to the elements of the websites that tell you about that, so what the process actually is. But essentially, um, it, goes to the, it goes to the British Museum, an independent valuation is commissioned, uh, those independent valuations are then uh, shared with the finder and the museum that wishes to acquire, 
Uh, all of that information gets sent as a pack of information to Treasury Valuation Committee along with all the reports that are written by fines liaison officers and other experts about the circumstances of the find. Occasionally we get information from the coroner's inquest, uh, which is pertinent maybe to how uh, rewards might be shared or not, uh, or the circumstances of discovery. Uh, you get a chance to write in and say, you don't always have to contest the valuation. You might be contesting some of the information which it, you feel is erroneous. So you might, might find that the, the finder has written something in their submission that you disagree with, and it's perfectly, you, all of that is shared with everybody. It, you can write back. You can say, actually, in our experience, we've already acquired an object like this two years ago, five years ago, and this is what it was valued at, and we'd like you to check that because we don't think that's been used to compare it. But you must engage with the process um, because, actually, if you want to acquire it, you're going to have to find that valuation. And then just to prove that we are real people, um, this is what the Treasury Valuation Committee looks like. We are a group that is independent of the British Museum and independent of uh, the Treasury Registrars and we're appointed by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport to represent different areas. Uh, so Harry, um, she uh, uh, is an editor of a metal detecting magazine. Uh, then we've got uh, two people that work um, in the industry in terms of art and antiques, coins. Got um, Professor Lord Renfrew who is current chair. Roger Bland who used to be the head of the Portable Antiquity Scheme. Obviously it's myself. We have a solicitor and we have an expert um, in applied arts. And I'm there to represent museum perspectives and also archaeological perspectives because I'm an archaeologist. Um, and we sit about once every six to eight weeks we usually have about 75 items of treasure on an agenda at any one time. That's groups of objects as well as single objects. And then we work our way through and we come to an agreement as to what the recommended valuation is. And we send that to the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport to the Secretary of State because that's our recommendation to them. And then occasionally we'll get kickbacks from either the finder or the museums and then we have to look at it again and we might have to commission second valuations and occasionally third valuations. Um, and so, on average, I'll give you the figures for 2017 because that's where I can see it. There was about 1,200 fines cases of treasure reported in 2017, as opposed to 55,500 fines of other kinds of objects that were recorded through Portable Antiquity Scheme. So that gives you the kind of like percentage. And of those 1,200, about a third will go through that process. Um, so it's actually a quite a small number of objects in comparison to what is being found generally through port and reported through portable antiquities detectors that actually gets dealt with through the treasure process. Where to get advice? Finds.org.uk, which is a portable antiquities scheme website, has a specific section on treasure. Where to get advice from museums? Again, and then obviously Society for Museum uh, of Archaeology. Um, and that's because we're producing the new standards and one of those standards will essentially be a more detailed version of what I've just told you in about the last 35 minutes. Thank you.